Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I feel I should introduce myself. Hi, I'm Leah. I was hoping to say this in Russian, but I don't feel confident enough. Um, I, here's the thing you might not know about me. I grew up in Greece, and specifically in the, in the relatively unknown island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, probably one of the very few you ever meet. In other news, I like making stuff. Here are some of my open source projects. There are a lot more on my GitHub. You might have used some of my work. If you have questions, you can ask me afterwards. Uh, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group, so if you have any questions about standards, I can answer those too, or at least I can try. And my, j my day job is a little unusual. I work at MIT as a human-computer interaction researcher. Human-computer interaction is just a fancy academic term for usability. And it's a very broad field. It goes from hardware things like 3D printing to software usability. And specifically, my research is about making web programming easier. You might have heard about our work we released it two, uh, two weeks ago as an open source project. It's called Mavo. It's a language that extends, extends HTML to describe web applications that store and transform data. And I've also written a book. It's translated into Russian. If you have it, I can sign it. Now about this talk. What is JSUX? It sounds almost like an oxymoron. I mean, UX is this term that you hear from your designer friends, right? It's a designer thing. What does it have to do with code? We're programmers. We, we don't care about this UX thing, right? No. Actually, if you look into the definitions of these terms, usability, UI, UX, they're not actually related to design. They're much more broad. Specifically, usability is the ease of use and learnability of a human-made ob human object, according to Wikipedia, at least. Nothing about design in there. For example, this has absolutely nothing to do with the web or software, but we can conclude that these rain there's a notion of usability in these rain boots, and it's pretty bad. I mean, can you imagine wearing these rain boots? They're horrible. Also, user experience, UX, refers to a person's total experience using a particular product, system, or service. Again, nothing to do with design. And lastly, another term you might have heard from your designer friends, UI. It's not specialized to design. The user interface is everything designed into an information device with which a human being may interact. So, while you might be thinking of a UI as more like something like this, and specifically, this is, this is basically two UIs. There's the Google Sheets UI, which is inside the Google Chrome UI. But also, a book is a UI. It's an information device that is consumed by humans. Slides are a UI. This slide right now is a UI. So it gets a little recursive there. A faucet is a UI. I actually took a photo of this faucet from a restaurant in New York because it took me several minutes to manage to use it. I went to the bathroom, I struggled for like five minutes, and then I, once I figured it out, I had to go back and get my phone and take a picture of it because it was just so bad. How many of you can, can guess how you actually use this faucet? How many of you think you just, you just lift the lever up? Lift, raise hands. How many think it's used like that? That's what I thought too. But nope, that did nothing. My next attempt was maybe I can try to turn it like left or right. Nope, nothing. And after looking at it in puzzlement, I realized there is documentation there. Look at the lower right corner. There's documentation for how to use this faucet. Here's a tip. If you need documentation for an interface, it's probably a bad interface. And the designers of this faucet knew, knew this. That's why they added the documentation. 
So what does this tell us? It's actually motion activated. If you look carefully, there's actually this little eye that detects motion. So you have to place your hands in this specific place under the faucet, and then you get water. And the lever at the top, it's a decoy, it doesn't really do much, it just changes the temperature. That's it. So, as you can see, the notion of an interface is much wider than we thought. But this talk is not about faucets, as interesting as I find them. This talk is about code, because your code is also a UI. If you're writing code to be consumed by human beings, if you're writing a library or any sort of API that your coworkers will use, it doesn't have to be an open source library. If you're writing code that your, that your coworkers will call, or a maintainer, or even yourselves in the future, you're creating a UI, and the same principles apply. I, I finally decided to make a talk about this, because I review a lot of pull requests and I see this over and over. People who are eager to contribute and they see that there's this feature missing. So they take the time and they, they code it and they send a pull request to add this feature. But they have never considered how will their code be used by other humans. It's, it, it's often obvious that they just, they just did what was easier for them without considering other people who will use their API. And it, it pains me, every time I have to reject a pull request, it pains me because I know that people have put effort into this and just out of love for the project, they're not gaining anything, they're not getting paid for it. So I, every time I have to reject a pull request, something cries inside me. So I decided, maybe this is how I can help. Maybe I can do a talk about this. So, like I said before, if you need documentation for an interface, it's typically a bad interface. This doesn't always apply to code. Yes, sometimes we have to look at documentation. But try to put yourselves in the position of the user, which is always a good thing to do when you're designing interfaces. Try to, to walk a, a, a mile in the shoes of your users. Think of yourselves when you're using a new library or a new API. Yes, you do look at documentation, but how much documentation do you really look at? Chances are you probably look at the getting started guide and then you're like, okay, where's the CDN of this library? I wanna try it out. We don't read like pages and pages of documentation. We only look at those after when we've stumbled on something, when we have a problem. We don't look at pages of documentation just to get started. We only read the bare minimum. So code that is self-evident, code that is easy to guess, or code that is easy to understand from looking at other people's code because a lot of learning happens by copy and paste. That's code with good usability. So the first rule, if you take one thing from this talk, make it this one. Good interfaces make the simple easy and the complex possible. If your interface is simple but it only allows simple things, it's very limiting. If, if it allows everything, if it makes the complex things possible, but the complexity gets in the way of the simple things, then it's a pain to use. Good interfaces make the simple things easy and the complex things possible. For example, this would be a terrible, terrible API. How many of you have used compare document position? Not many, okay. It's a DOM API. It's kind of weird. It returns a bit mask, and you have to do a bitwise end to, f to figure out the results, and there are some constant with numbers that you can compare it with. So it's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of comparing two elements, two nodes, the positions of two nodes. Depending on where they are, um, the result could tell you if one contains the other, if one follows the other, precedes the other, if they're completely disconnected. It tells you everything you need to know, but sometimes you don't need to know everything. Sometimes all you need to know is whether a node contains another node. And when, when that's all you need, compare document position is a terrible API whose complexity gets in the way. However, this is a Hall of Fame slide because even though it's a very complex API, it has a shortcut. It didn't used to in the beginning. Many years ago, compare document position was all you had when you were using vanilla JavaScript. But thanks to jQuery, eventually vanilla JavaScript was influenced and especially the DOM was improved a lot. jQuery has done a lot for vanilla JavaScript. 
um, and contains is one of the methods we got from it. Node contains is a perfectly reasonable, a perfectly readable method. It basically tells you exactly what it does. It reads like natural English, but it's limited. It only tells you if a node contains another node. So sometimes you have to go back to the complex API method, and that's okay. It's okay to have complex methods. It's okay to have simple methods. But just having one of the two is either limiting or hard to use. One of my favorite examples of bad APIs is the SVG DOM. Not the SVG itself, SVG is great, but the SVG DOM is a huge pain. There are rumors that it was created under the influence of drugs. I don't know if they're true, but that's what I've heard. How many of you have tried to use the SVG DOM, either via framework or plainly? Okay, maybe the library hides the, the horribleness, I'm not sure, but if you try to use vanilla SVG DOM, you wanna cut your veins, like it's terrible. <laughs> Let me give you a, a small example. Let's say you get a variable, um, uh, you, you get a reference to the circle element, and then you, gotta, you wanna get the CX attribute as a property. We do that a lot in normal DOM. So how many of you think that circle.cx will return 50? How many? Some of you. The others are getting suspicious just because I said it's gonna be so bad. Um, so, as you might have guessed, no, it doesn't return 50. It returns an SVG animated length object. What? I don't even have any animation in there. What do I need an SVG animated length object for? And I can see that it has a base val property and then a nim val property. What? Okay, let's try to get the base val property. So I, my next attempt is circle.cx.base val. Surely now it should return 50, right? How many think it's gonna return 50? Some? No, it returns an SVG length object with a unit type and a value and a value in specified units. What? And of course, eventually, I can get my result by doing circle.cx.baseval.value. That finally gives me 50. Finally, after three properties. This is a great example of complexity getting in the way. I'm sure that there's a good, a, a, a good reason why in some cases you might need a different base val and a different anim val. I'm sure there's a good reason for some, that sometimes you might need an SVG length object. But you don't always need them, and there should be a simpler way. Also, let's say I don't know about this complexity. I'm used to using the normal HTML DOM, so I try to set the center of the circle. So I do circle.cx equals five. And I expect, I mean, either I expect the, the circle to move or I expect an error, right? Nope. If I try to read it back, it's 50. No error, nothing. The browser just gives us a big old fuck you. So yeah, this is why I hate the SVG DOM. It's, it's, a, it's an excellent anti-pattern. So a good way to make the simple easy and the complex possible is, sensitive, is sensible defaults. The more, the, the, more sensible def the, the more sensible defaults you have, the fewer parameters I have to set to call your API. How many of you have used the URL constructor? Okay, a few. So, that's a perfectly valid URL, right? I don't expect this to fail, and yet, it fails with a type error. Fail to construct URL, invalid URL. The first time I got this, I was like, what? What is invalid about this? Well, it turns out you have to provide a base. If it's not an absolute URL, you always have to provide a base, even if it's just location. Why couldn't location be the default? And indeed, if I provide location, it works just fine. Especially these days, there's no excuse. It's trivial to provide defaults. 
And as you can see here, defaults can even depend on your other parameters. You can even hack defaults to make parameters mandatory if your default is a function call that throws an error. In this case, we have two parameters, both with defaults, and the second one, uh, the second parameter depends on the first. So you can see if I call it with no parameters, I get the default values for both. If I only call it with one parameter, I get the first parameter being what I set, and the second one depending on the first. And if I set both of them, well, I get what I said, what I, what I called. A deadly sin of usability, which also boils down to making the simple easy and the complex possible, you'll see this is a running theme throughout this talk, is re requiring boilerplate. I'm sure most of you have used HTML, HTTP, XML, HTTP request naked at some point, even if later on you move to libraries. At least when you were learning JavaScript, you used it, right? How many have used it? All of you, okay, great. And you must remember the pain that every single time you had to send a request, you had to write a boilerplate of several lines. And this is actually better than it used to be. When I was learning JavaScript, oh, it was way worse than this. There was already state change, and there were ActiveX controls, and you had to check if XML HTTP request was available or use the ActiveX control. Anyway, even this is pretty terrible and it's still an improvement. Compare, if you, if you don't see what's wrong with this, if you don't see what's wrong with typing like six lines of code to do a simple get request to, and fetch some JSON, contrast it with this, the fetch API. It's beautiful, right? It tells you exactly what it's doing. It returns promises that read like natural English language. It's, it's some of the most beautiful JavaScript APIs. I always think it's a worthy goal if, you're, if, you're, if, if my code reads like natural language. This is what I strive for always. Or if my APIs can be called with something that reads naturally. It's not always achievable, but it's always something I aspire to. One of my favorite bad examples is IndexedDB. How many of you have tried to use IndexedDB without a library? Okay, a few. You know the pain. I don't expect you to read this code or understand it. I just want to show you the sheer amount of code. This just creates a database and sets some values. That's it. And I needed 40 lines. This is pretty much as short as it gets. I saw someone taking a photo of my slides. By the way, my slides are online. No need to keep notes or photos, unless you want to. I mean, that's fine. But yeah, this much code just to do the most basic thing with this API. Another, uh, something you might have heard is the robustness principle, which, uh, which what, what is relevant to this is be liberal in what you expect, uh, you accept. The whole thing is be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you do. But the second part doesn't really apply to API design. So what does that mean? Be liberal in what you accept. It means uh, whatever the user throws at you, try to deal with it instead of throwing an error. It's very frustrating when you're learning a new API and you keep getting errors. You try something, you get an error. You try something else, you get another error. And it's like, damn it, I can't get this to work. In this case, the URL constructor is a good example, at least when it comes to its first parameter. If you throw an, a string at it, it works, as long as it's absolute. If you throw another URL object at it, that's fine too. If you even throw an object that looks like a URL object, like location, location is not a URL object. It just looks like a URL object. It has similar properties. That is okay as well. Contrast that with, for example, the set constructor. The first time I used the set constructor, I wrote something like this. And I expect, I mean, this was obvious to me. I want to create a set with one element, the number 42. Instead, I got an error. Uncaught type error. Symbol iterator is not a function. This is the point where I also tell you that it's a, it, all, if you're gonna throw an error message, 
try to make it, try to, to, to throw an error message that actually makes sense. For people who don't know about iterators, this doesn't make sense. Even for people who do know about iterables, but they don't know about symbols and symbol.iterator, this wouldn't make sense. This is a very confusing error message. So this is an, this is an anti-pattern in two ways, both for throwing too many errors and also for not throwing understandable errors. Instead, what I, what I needed to do to get it to work was to provide an array or any other iterable a set would also work. And then it works. Another thing to keep in mind is when you're writing methods, try to support mass parameters but also singular parameters. If people want to, if, if people want to throw a lot of arguments, a, a lot of arguments at you, accept that as well. That also, there, there is also a special case to be liberal in what you accept. But I see this so often in APIs, especially in DOM APIs. I'm sure that when you were learning JavaScript, you, before you started using any libraries, at least, you have definitely done something like this at some point. A, a series of set attributes. Just because you wanted to set a lot of attributes on an element, I mean, that's what you do if you create an element. You often have to set a lot of attributes on it. I won't even ask how many of you have done this. I know it's probably all of you. It's so repetitive, and it also hinders, and it's, it's not just tedious to write, but it also hinders understanding of this code, because when, you, when, when somebody else comes and, read this, and reads this code, they have to mentally parse it and ignore that the first part is this repetitive audio.set attribute. And yes, it's a very quick thing. Our brains do it quickly. You don't realize that you're doing it. But over, over time, if you do it enough times, it can cause strain. Instead, wouldn't it be great if you could do something like this? Just an object literal with all the attributes you want to set. And there is no disambiguation problem. If the first, if the first argument is a string, you assume it's, a, it's one attribute and a value. If the first attribute is an object, if, if, if the first argument is an object, then you're setting multiple attributes. I mean, it's too late to do this and set attributes, but you can keep that in mind for your own APIs. If it makes sense to do the same thing multiple times, provide it as a convenience method with the same name. Check, is this, is this an object is it, or is it a primitive? And act accordingly. Sadly, in JavaScript, we don't really have polymorphism. You, we have to do it manually. In other languages, you can have multiple signatures and act accordingly. Sadly, not in JavaScript, at least yet. Another example of not being able to do things in mass, again with set attribute, is setting attributes on multiple elements instead of setting multiple attributes on the same element. Even with modern ES6, we would have to do something like this. And with ES5, it would be even longer. Why would we have to loop over each element and do this again and again? This is such a common task. This is one of the reasons why jQuery succeeded, because for every single thing it's, it's supported, it's supported doing it both in a singular way and in a mass way. Think about it, for every single method in jQuery, or at least every single method that it makes sense to do this, it supports this. So wouldn't it be great if you could just call set attribute on a collection, or, or even have a static method where you can pass the collection on it? We can't do this for set attribute, but you can do it for your own APIs. A caveat is that I've also seen in some APIs is to not only support mass operations. It's great when you support mass operations, but I shouldn't have to convert my arguments to an object or an array if I, if I only have one. If I only needed to set one attribute, I shouldn't have to convert it to an object literal. If I only had to set an attribute on one element, I shouldn't have to convert it to a collection. One example that I'm not sure if it's a good one or a bad one, so I'm putting it up there for your judgment, is um, object.defined property. In this case, it supports both 
doing this in mass and doing this in a singular way. And it's almost perfect, except that you have to learn two different method names. You have to look at the documentation and see that, it also, that there's also this defined properties method, which if you never look at the documentation, you might never know about this. If it's the same method, you might, you might try it on your own at some point and see, does this work? Oh yeah, it works, look at that. So I'm leaning towards that this is, a, this is a Hall of Fame example, because at least it supports both forms. But I don't like it very much because it, it supports them with different method names that you have to learn. Another deadly sin that applies specifically to JavaScript, so far we were, we, uh, most of the advice I mentioned is for programming in general. This one is specifically about JavaScript, and probably some other languages, but not all. This is an example of using the date object, which I'm sure many of you have blissfully forgotten by now. There are so many nice libraries, Moment.js, many others. Um, but if you decide to work with the raw date object, I don't know, maybe you're a masochist or something. Um, this is how you get and set a month. This is, not, this is not a syntax that is native to JavaScript. This is a syntax that comes to, from Java. But JavaScript is not Java. It made sense in the beginning, because as you all know the story, Java, Java was very popular back then, so JavaScript emulates it superficially. But we've gone way past that. JavaScript is better than Java now. And we should start taking advantage of the ways that it's better. For example, accessors. Java developers are used to writing things like this. In fact, this crap is so common in Java that Java IDs generate it. If you, if you add a few properties in a class, you can generate all these accessor methods all this boilerplate, you can just right click in an ID and generate it. But we don't have to do this in, in JavaScript. Because in JavaScript, we can start by having, the, so the reason that Java developers do this is they're guarding against future changes. Because as, you, um, as I'm sure you know, you cannot change APIs. Once APIs are used by people, you cannot change them anymore. So, what happens if, for example, you want to run some extra code every time somebody sets the name? If you were just using a public name property, you can't do that in Java. You just can't. So instead, you have to guard against these future changes and create methods for every single property that you might want to get or set. But in JavaScript, we can just have accessors. We can start by having plain old public properties, and if we ever want to do something special when, the, when we get them or set them, we can just convert them to an accessor. And every, every code that uses our API doesn't have to change. This is an example of a month uh, property on date. By the way, I do not suggest changing native objects, just in case it wasn't clear, but I think Native, object, native objects make for good examples, um, because I don't have to badmouth someone else's library. Like, we can all badmouth native objects. Um, but I do not suggest modifying native objects. You'll see a lot of this, and keep, this, keep that in mind. So let's suppose date was our own object, and we could do something like that. And then we could just read the month or set the month as any other normal property. And it, behind the scenes, it could run any code we want. And not only is, is, is this shorter, it's also easier to read. We don't have to even read the name of the property to know that the first line is getting a property and the second line is setting a property. We can, read, we can scan this much faster. With the first example, with set month and get month, we actually had to read the method name and yes, I know you're thinking, my brain can do that in milliseconds. Yes, but it adds up. So I know some of you might be thinking at this point, won't someone please think of parameters? I mean, yeah, setting and getting properties like this is nice and beautiful when you don't have any additional parameters and you're just 
um, getting a stored value or setting a property to one value, it, then it works. But what happens if you also want to provide some additional objects, um, some additional options, like, yeah, set this property, but here are some options about how you set it. Not, nobody says you can't have both. You can have a month, prob a month accessor, and you can have a get month and set month property um, function. There's no rule against having both of them. So again, making the simple easy and the complex possible. If you, if you have a, a more complex use case where you need to set additional parameters, by all means, use the function. If you just want to set month to a, to a given value, you can use the property. You, why use the method in, in both of these cases? Local storage is a curious example because it does both. So there's the set item and get item methods, which are kind of weird, but also it supports getting and setting arbitrary properties, which is pretty much every single time I've used local storage, I've used it like this. I have no idea why the get item and set item methods exist. I think I heard there was a reason at some point, but yeah, I, I don't really see it. So you might be wondering at this point, okay, with predetermined properties like month, I get it, I can just have an ES5 accessor. But here, you could, you could set and get any property. How can I possibly trap this? How many of you have used proxies? ES6 proxies. Okay. Prepare to be excited then. So proxies allow you to take an, a normal JavaScript object and create another object from it where every time you set a property on it, any property, every time you get a property, every time you use an in operator or call a method or you pretty much do anything with it, then you, you, can, you can execute arbitrary code. There's like 12 traps. Um, get, set, and has are the most popular ones, but there are, there are traps for everything. There are even traps for when you set the prototype of the object. So you can, you can do amazing metaprogramming with proxies. Here's a, a, a simple example where you have this hidden object, which is a perfectly normal JavaScript object, nothing special about it. You pass it through the proxy constructor, and it returns an object where every time you get a property from it, the get trap is called. So the function in the get trap over there. And every time you set a property on there, on there the, the function in the set trap is called, and so on. And for example, what can you do with it in there? For example, you can check if the property is available, then you return it, otherwise you call some arbitrary method. The, the limits the, are really endless. You could do anything in there. Similarly with set, similarly with has, which is, which is when, you're trying to, when you're checking if a property is available. Um, and, all, and, and, and something really important is that if you don't set a trap, then it just forwards it to the, to the, to the object, to the underlying object. So if you don't want to do anything special when a property is set, for instance, or, if, when, or when a property is get, or, 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 you try to read, or when you try to read a property, then you don't even have to add a trap. You only add a trap when you, do, when you want to do something special which is actually a, an excellent example of sensible defaults. Try, imagine how bad the proxy API would be if you had to set every single trap every time you created a proxy. If you had to add like 12 callbacks, we wouldn't be able to use proxies without a library. But thankfully, it's designed quite elegantly and you only have to override the traps you, want to, you, you need to override. I love proxies. I could do an entire talk about proxies. Mavo couldn't exist without proxies. If you've read about API design, probably the, the main thing, the first thing that it mentioned would be Boolean traps, which I've called parameter traps here because I find that it applies to more than just Booleans, at least numbers. So what do I mean by parameter traps? Let's look at an example. 
How many of you have used the clone node method? Most of you, excellent. So I'm, I'm sure you know what this code does. But try to approach it from the mindset of someone who's using this for the first time or who's, who hasn't used it and is looking at someone else's code. Okay, they're cloning this element. Yeah, that makes sense. And then true. True what? Like I really want to clone this node? <laughs> like please clone this node like for reals? As you know, true just means clone the entire subtree. But there's nothing in there that indicates what it's for. Similarly, when you're adding an event listener with vanilla JS, the first two parameters make sense. Yeah, you're adding an event listener onto element. The event type is focused. That makes sense. You're adding a callback. OK, that makes sense as well. Of course, you have to execute some code. And then true. True what? Like, please, please really add this event listener? As you know, it means capture. But there's no way of knowing this just by reading code. And why stop at one when you can have 10? <laughs> I have no idea what any of these arguments do after key press. This is the kind of code that you cannot write or read without documentation. And there's also parameters which make sense individually, but their order doesn't. Like every time I use vanilla JS with in the replace child method, I cannot for the life of me remember if it's new child first or old child first. Even as I'm giving this talk, I cannot tell you for sure. Of course, our beloved Canvas API. How many of you can confidently explain what each of those numbers means? Nobody? I, I wouldn't ask you. One, two, okay, a few more. Think about 10 in the entire audience. So as you can tell, that, there's a problem right there. We have like what, at, at least 100 people in here, and only 10 can explain what these numbers do. And you, you get, to add insult to injury, you get all these online playgrounds which, which tell you things like, change these numbers to see what each one is for. Can you imagine operating a microwave or an oven or something where the buttons had no labels and there was just one label that's, that was saying, press these buttons to see what each one is for. <laughs> Can you imagine the real world operating like this? Or even in software. Let's suppose you had a dialog box to set something. And all it had was some parameter, some other parameter, a third parameter, and the last parameter, and just sliders. And underneath, for definitions of these parameters, please see the manual. Can you imagine if, if, if GUIs worked like this? This is basically the state of programming today. What if instead of this, we had something like this. Now you can instantly tell what each number is for. And more, more than that, you don't have to remember the order of anything. And you can omit any of those parameters without having to provide placeholders. Or even like this, if you want to be even more detailed. And yes, it's more verbose. But code is only written once, but it's read many times. So if something is a little more verbose, but it actually adds to understanding, I think the trade-off is worth it. And switching towards APIs that accept an object literal argument is, seems to be the way that even native APIs are going. It allows us to have parameters that are named 
It allows us to have parameter in any order, and basically anything can be optional. For example, there used to be this locale string method that nobody used, but now, after the internationalization API, it's got new powers. Now you can format numbers and currencies and everything right in JavaScript without any libraries by using this, this method with its new powers. You pass in a locale and some options via an object literal. And yes, it's not, not all options are in an object literal, but here, the first option is kind of mandatory. Of course, if you're calling to locale string, you have to provide a locale. So, and it's a string, so it's, it's readable even without a label. But for the other options that are less common and less self-evident, an object literal helps. Or ad event listener is also going that way. The third argument has been converted to an object. I forget how many browsers support this, but I think it's a few. So basically, if it's a Boolean, we get the old behavior. If it's an object, you, we get this behavior, which is an object literal with multiple options. One of them is the old capture. We also have a new once option, which is pretty cool. It just, it allows you to bind the listener that executes just once and then unbinds itself. And especially with the structuring and ES6 default parameters, there's no excuse. It's so easy to add, uh, to make your parameters into a literal with defaults. And as you can see here, if you call it with no parameters, you get the defaults. If you call it with an, object, an empty object literal, you still get the defaults. If you just set one, you get that one. You pretty much what you would expect it to work like. And also, using default parameters right in there would also allow future documentation tools to be more intelligent. I'm really looking forward for such documentation tools to exist. Another sin, uh, which I've hinted, or, uh, I've hinted to already, is unnecessary error conditions. If you can avoid throwing an error, do avoid it. I mean, obviously, if you get input that doesn't make sense, it's better to throw an error, an understandable error. But if you can do something useful with that input, don't throw an error. For example, we've already seen the URL uh, constructor and how it complains pointlessly instead of using a sensible default. We've also seen how the set constructor complains pointlessly if the parameter is not an iterable. Also, let's suppose we create two elements, a div and a paragraph. And then we want, we, maybe we have a method somewhere that replaces elements for some reason. Like, in this case, it doesn't make sense because the second line is immediately after the first line. But the second line of code could be buried deeply in, in some hierarchy of method calls. And in this case, I want to replace two elements that are not in the DOM with each other. Why not? And yet, I get an exception. The new method, element.replaceWith, is so much better, both because it's much more readable. You don't, need, you don't have the redundancy of referring to the parent of the element. I mean, why refer to the parent? To ask for permission? It doesn't make sense. It's much more readable, and it doesn't have this error condition. Oops. Also, how many of you have used the history API? Excellent, most of you. So you're familiar with things like this. Isn't this ugly as fuck? Every time I want to add a URL to, to, to history, every time I use the history API, I have to provide these pointless first two arguments. And that's because the third argument, which is the most important, is not first, it's third. If you, put, if you place your most important arguments first, then you don't end up in this case, you don't have this problem. 
if, if your most important arguments are first, you don't have the issue of, of users having to provide placeholders and pointless values like these just to get to the, to the arguments they actually want to set. Imagine if it was actually like this. Isn't it much more beautiful? Much more readable, much more understandable? Another deadly sin is double negatives. In general, in language, double negatives are hard to understand. As, I'm, as, as I suspect you've learned at school um, when writing essays and stuff. That applies to code as well. For example, the disabled property. Here I'm setting it to false. So I have to, mental, to do the mental gymnastics of, okay, so I'm disabling the disabled state, which means that it's enabled. Like, yeah, you can figure it out, but it takes you a bit. It takes you a few milliseconds. And like we said, it adds up. Good interfaces are the interfaces that don't make you think. The less you think while reading the code, the better the, 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 better the code. Wouldn't it be much better if it was just enabled? These statements are basically equivalent. Enabled equals true, or disabled equals false. And yet, this makes much more sense. Something else that is specifically about JavaScript is chaining. You, sh you should write APIs that allow chaining. It doesn't cost you anything, and it could help your users. For example, this always bothered me about DOM APIs. They return undefined. If it's a void method that doesn't really do anything, it returns undefined. Why? It's useless. If it returned this, like if, if every time I called set attribute, it returned the element itself, then I could do this, which is still very verbose, but it's slightly better. Or same with the Canvas API. This is, this is probably the API that most people hate about not being chainable. Why not something like this? Keep in mind that every, if, you, if you want to rename the CTX variable here, you have to do it how many times? Nine times. That's pretty much the opposite of dry. And it's so simple to make APIs chainable. You just return this. Returning undefined is wasteful. There's no point to it. If I want to, to just not use the return value, I can just not use the return value. You can even have a method that makes other methods chainable. And it only takes like four lines. There is no excuse. I even wrote a library a while ago that that's all it did. It made native APIs chainable. It went through all the methods, checked if they returned undefined, and if they did, it returned this instead. It never caught on, but it was an interesting experiment. We've also seen some examples of redundancy. Uh, my favorites are these DOM APIs again. There's such a minefield of bad API design. For example, if you want to remove a child, you have to refer to its parent. Why? Is it a teenager and I have to ask its parent for permission? Like, what the hell? There's absolutely no need for this. If I can get the parent from, from the element, I shouldn't have to provide it. The method should do it for me, which is what the new element.remove does, but it has less browser support. It's pretty decent browser support, but still less. Similarly with insert before. If I want to insert a node before another node, I shouldn't have to refer to its parent, which is what the new element dot before does. Also, I'm, I, I'm sure those of you that have tried to use the vanilla DOM have noticed how it tends to have really long names, really weird names. Like, why parent node? I know what we're used to it now, but why parent node? Why couldn't it have been parent? Or even child nodes. Yeah, we're used to it now, but why not children? Yes, I know we already have a children, but we didn't back when child nodes was invented. Or add event listener. It's kind of a very long method, especially for something you do so often. Why not element.bind? Or element.on, like jQuery? Or element.add event even. Even that makes more sense. Or 
<laughs> yeah. Get bounding client wrecked. Seriously? Why not just wrecked? Or not even a, a method at all. It could be a getter. And again, about naming. Naming should describe what it does, not how it works. I don't care about your method's internal workings. I shouldn't have to. I'm using this method because I want to do something. And the naming of the method should be appropriate. Query selector and query selector all, seriously? I don't think about getting an element by a selector as a query. Query th makes me think of databases. Not, uh, yes, I know it's DOM querying. But that's not how you think about getting elements by selector. Sure, the new query and query all methods are a bit shorter, but they still have this weird query term in them, which doesn't really make sense. It's not how people talk about this. There were some find and find all methods proposed at some point. It turns out we can't do them because they collide with very widespread use of some framework. But these were, would have been so much better names. This is a very curious example, the jQuery dollar, and a few other libraries also use it. If you asked anybody before jQuery became popular about the dollar, they would tell you it's a terrible idea. A dollar? It doesn't make sense. And even today, when, when somebody who's a newbie to JavaScript reads code, they're like, what is this dollar? But it, it, it succeeded, so you can't really argue with reality. I think at this point, we can say that it pretty much has succeeded. People flocked to jQuery because, partly because of the dollar. And that's because it was such, it, it's a method that you use so, wide, in, so widely, so often, that it can get away with, not make, with a name as short as this that doesn't make sense. Because yes, you're a little bit confused when you first see it, but you learn it pretty fast, and then you appreciate being able to understand code that uses it really fast without having to read a method name. Another example of single letter method names being acceptable is localization. In general, when you have something that is used over and over and over, it sometimes makes sense to make it shorter, even if it reduces its readability. Because having to read the same word again and again can actually decrease usability. It's all a trade-off. Also responding to changes. I couldn't find a, DOM, a native like DOM example for this, uh, because typically browsers are pretty good at doing this. But libraries in the wild are very bad at this. One example is this layout library that I really like. It does bin packing layout. You can have like a gallery with all these irregular sizes and it looks beautiful. But the problem is, anytime anything changes in your DOM, you have to call this method. So basically, everywhere in your code that changes anything in that grid, it needs to know that you're using this packery library. It completely destroys the decoupling of your code. Suddenly, my entire code base needs to know about this. And if I suddenly stop using Packery, I have to go across my entire code base and remove this call. It would have been so much better if Packery was using mutation observers and actually observed changes to the DOM. How many of you have used mutation observers? OK, fewer than I thought. <laughs> So mutation observers let you react to changes in the DOM, changes to attributes, changes in the adding, removing children, um, even changes down in the subtree. So you create a mutation observer like this, you only provide the callback, and then you, observe, you can use the same mutation observer to observe different elements with different options. So it's done in two stages. I'm not sure how good of an API that is, but what it does for libraries is amazing, and more should use it. it. It enables code that is very decoupled. Basically, libraries can react to changes that happen because of some unrelated code, some unrelated library, without these two libraries needing to know about each other. And also, if you're writing a library for people who don't know JavaScript, or who don't know much JavaScript, you can save them one step, because you can already react to changes without them having to think about that.
And there's also more observers on the way. Resize observer is basically like on resize, but for individual elements. It lets you react to changes on the size of the element, regardless of what causes these changes. Intersection observer lets you fire some code when an element actually becomes visible in the viewport, regardless of why. It's, a, it's amazing, I used it recently, and it saved me. It, I had this interaction that was really, really slow, and I was trying to optimize it, because like, Every time, I was making a collection editable, and it was a really long collection, and I was making each element editable at once, which involved a lot of nodes of adding, removing, changing nodes. It was really slow. And then I, I, I used Intersection Observer to make elements editable only when they're actually visible, and it went from a huge bottleneck to instant. And you could not observe any difference. It, to the user, it looked exactly the same. And it's actually supported in, um, at least in recent Chrome versions, and I think a few others. But the good thing is, there's a polyfill, so you can use it with a polyfill. And yes, some of the, especially mutation observers can affect performance. As we've, as I've discussed, intersection observer can actually increase performance. But yeah, mutation observers could decrease performance. In theory, I use them extensively. I haven't actually observed any difference. But in theory, yes, if you observe too many things. So try to observe as little as possible. Try to observe as small of a scope as possible. And unobserve when no longer needed. Don't observe pointlessly. And if it's much of, if it's a lot, if it's a concern of yours, don't force it on your users. Give them a choice to enable them, or a choice to disable them. Another deadly sin is forgetting two string and two JSON methods. That's also very specific to JavaScript. Um, I'm gonna go over time a little bit, but I've discussed it, and it's okay. Um, so. How many of you have used attribute nodes? Yeah, they're kind of an obscure API. If you try to convert them to strings, you just get this, which is the, just the object default to string method. It's kind of pointless, it doesn't really give you anything. But what if, what if it was our own object, and we could modify it, and we could return something useful? Then if you did the same thing, and you converted them to string, you could get something that's at least useful for debugging, and probably more things as well. A Hall of Fame example is dates in this case. If you try to stringify an object that converts a date, even though JSON doesn't support dates per se, dates have a to JSON method, so there's, it returns a, re a representation of the date that you can use to, rec to recreate the date object that this was made from. On the other hand, if you try to convert um, a regex to JSON, you just get an empty object, which is the default behavior for any object. And as you can tell, it's pretty useless. What if regex has actually had a JSON method? It could be something like this, and then when we converted them to JSON, we would get a representation that actually makes sense. Wouldn't that be nice? We can't do it for regexes, but you can do it for your own libraries. And lastly, you should also have an HTML API. This sounds counterintuitive. I'm, I'm at a JavaScript conference, you're JavaScript developers, and I'm telling you about a, an HTML API. What even is an HTML API? So an HTML API is when your library can be called just by writing HTML. And it doesn't make sense for every library. If your library has no UI component, and it's just about making code easier, then yeah, it doesn't make sense to have an HTML API. But if your library is such that someone who doesn't write JavaScript can understand what it does, then it should have an HTML API. That's a, that's a rule of thumb. For example, oh, at, I asked if, a while ago, um, attention people who write HTML and CSS, how comfortable are you with JavaScript? And it turns out that about half of people who write HTML and CSS, at least based on this sample, which is, yeah, it's a Twitter poll, but it's actually a pretty big sample. It's three and a, three and a half thousand people voted on this. 
So yeah, it's not exactly a scientific poll, but I'm not aware of any other data on this. And according to this, half of the people who write HTML and CSS are not very comfortable with JavaScript. In fact, almost one in five is not comfortable. We tend to not to think about people like that because when you write JavaScript, you kind of live in a JavaScript bubble where everybody writes JavaScript. So we're like, yeah, actually, let's move everything to JavaScript. Let's move HTML to JavaScript and CSS and JavaScript. But that's actually putting up barriers against collaboration with other people who might not actually write JavaScript. And not everybody should have to learn JavaScript. Not everybody has to become a software engineer. I don't think designers should have to learn JavaScript. Yeah, they should be able to write HTML and CSS but they shouldn't have to become programmers. For example, jQuery UI, if you wanted to turn, a, if you wanted to create a slider with two handles, you had to actually call JavaScript. And even though that's not a lot of JavaScript, it still makes a lot of assumptions about the person writing this code. They have to understand what arrays are, what object literals are, methods, uh, what is this dollar function, um, all sorts of things, booleans. Com contrast this with HTML5 sliders. And yes, this multi-handle syntax was actually dropped from the spec, but I still think it was, it's a great example of API design. And the only reason it was dropped from the spec is that there were no implementations. There are implementations of sliders with one handle, just not with two. In fact, other people are seeing how HTML is so much easier, even for developers, that they're creating entire frameworks. Like Mozilla is creating this virtual reality framework with HTML. If I click on the Getting Started Guide, you can see some code examples here. It's using web components, and basically you can create entire virtual reality scenes just by writing HTML. I think that's amazing. And my work at MIT is also about enabling people to do more with HTML. Um, our framework is called Mavo, and by just including it in the page, you can th create things like a to-do list, um, or a homepage that stores data on GitHub, um, that you can upload pictures to, and edit, the, edit some rich text or some plain text, or you can have like a portfolio of images that also stores on GitHub, um, all sorts of things. Basically, anything that stores, transforms, displays data. And the thing is, good HTML APIs not only enable, the, uh, enable um, people who don't write JavaScript to do things they couldn't, but also they're easier for developers as well, which is why when something starts being supported by native HTML, we start doing it that way instead of doing it with a library. Some API design basics for HTML APIs is have an init selector. Um, most libraries should not just operate on the page without any indication that the author actually wants them to operate in that area. Uh, it could be a class, it could be an attribute, it could be anything. Uh, settings could be, if it's a Boolean setting, you could have a class uh, or an attribute without a value, just like HTML does it. In general, it's good to follow the conventions of existing HTML. Um, if it's a string or number, you could do it with data attributes. Um, if it's uh, an object, you could point to another element. And if it's a function, it can just be in JS. I'm not saying that every single parameter in your library has to be possible to set with HTML. If someone can write functions, they can write JavaScript. Um, and in its selector, for example, in this, this is probably the most complex one I've written. Usually it's just a class. Um, for example, in Prism, elements with a, with a language hyphen something class or elements that are inside one of those. Um, a Prism is a syntax highlighting library. Uh, you might have heard of it. And it operates on code elements that have either a class of this form or are inside an element that does. And its init selector looks like this. Usually init selectors are just a simple class selector. Um, this is a native HTML example where you, the parameter is actually an, basically an array and we're pointing to another element by ID. 
It could have been, if, it's, if it was your own API, you could also allow selectors there. But yeah, you, you point to it via the list attribute, and then you have a data list with it. And you can use that on inputs, on sliders, on this is a color input. Um, and I can change them to something else. You can see how it changes to red now, uh, and so on. And dialogues are a bad, a bad example. Yes, they're declarative. They are in HTML. I can add an open attribute to open them. But if I want model dialogues, then I have to write JavaScript. For example, let's say I, have to, I, I add a button. Yes, this is horrible, but it prevents me from having to have two code areas. Do not use inline event listeners. But yeah, basically, you have to learn to ha you have to write some JavaScript to use this, even though it's an HTML element, which is not great. It's better than having to do everything in JavaScript, but not quite there. Um, sometimes it makes sense for settings for HTML settings to inherit. Um, you can either use a class, which is what Prism does, like you can set a class on your body element for the entire document and override it individually. Or these days, you can also use CSS variables because they're actually supported by every browser now. <laughs> yeah, it's really exciting. You can change them with JavaScript and they update dynamically. They're amazing. Once more people catch up that they're supported everywhere, we'll see amazing things happening with them. So instead of attributes, you could use CSS variables, and then you get the inheritance for free because they inherit by default. So you can just do something like this, and you get whatever value is appropriate. I wish CSS variables were around when I wrote Prism. Now it's too late to do this. Um, script elements could be one choice for global settings that don't apply to any individual element. Don't make this the only way, because some people use CMSs and stuff, and they cannot actually modify the script elements. But it's an interesting choice when, when it's possible, because you can use very generic attribute names, because it's very specific what it's about. And you can use document.current script in your JavaScript to get the value. Um, some, an anti-pattern to avoid is treating HTML like a JavaScript shortcut. I've seen this a lot in people that start using, creating HTML APIs. It's good that they care enough to create an HTML API, but they treat it like a shortcut for other developers instead of something that will enable people with less technical skills to do more. For example, in Parquery again, there is a way to initialize it with HTML with, via a, a data Parquery attribute, but it requires a JSON object in that attribute. Why not just have two normal attributes in there? This is how HTML works. There's no native HTML attribute that accepts JSON. That's not how HTML works. Also, pointless, uh, uh, requiring users to write pointless HTML is not an HTML API. Do not kid yourselves. I was, I'm very excited about web components, but, and there's this, if you go to Polymer, which is like pretty much the flagship framework for, for enabling web components today, you see this demo of an eShop, and you're like, oh, that's cool. There's this eShop that I can create with web components, and look at that. And then you look at the, at the HTML, and it's basically this. What is even the point of having a shop app element? Why not just do everything in JavaScript if you're going to do that? How does this help? You have to actually, you have to edit two, uh, code in two places for no reason. This is not what an HTML API is about. Yes, you can do amazing things with web components, and they enable HTML APIs to be so much more elegant and, and mimic native HTML so much better. But this is not it. That is not the way to go. I've written about HTML APIs at Smashing Magazine. If you want to read more, just Google HTML APIs Smashing Magazine or look at my slides. They have a link. Um, now that CSS variables are supported everywhere, I think we might start seeing things like CSS APIs. Basically, I think libraries, uh, UI libraries will start having lists of CSS variables that they support for configuration. I've tried to do something like that in this 
multi-range polyfill that I wrote. And I think in the future we're going to see this happening much more, like long lists of CSS variables that you can use to customize things. And be, uh, before I leave you, some parting advice. Cherish the knob within. We live in a community that does not cherish the knob within. Instead, we try to, to always pretend that we're more and more hardcore. But in terms of usability, that is actually harmful. You cannot understand usability issues if, if you know too much. It's called the, the curse of knowledge. If, if you understand your API too well, you cannot see the problems anymore. You have to ask someone else that doesn't understand it. So always try to walk in the shoes of someone who's new, who, of someone who doesn't know too much. Try to keep, to hold on to this mindset as long as possible. Because in this case, that's actually what you need. And cold with empathy. Try to imagine yourself in the shoes of your users. Don't just think, what do I want to accomplish as a developer, but also think, if I was using this API, would I like this? Would I be able to understand this? Would I have to read the documentation to use this? That's all I had for you. Thank you very much. Spasiba. By the way, oh, these are my slides, and I have stickers. If you want a Code Pirate logo sticker or a Mavo sticker, just ask me. I have them with me. That's it. Thank you.